thank you, thank you so much. And Richard, I, I hope you woke enough people up. Uh, I don't know what I'll do. I'll dance or something. <laughs> uh, so I'm representing the American Federation of Asian Researchers, their scientific director, my boss is Jim uh, Kirkland. Um, and the American Federation of Asian Research, you're welcome when you come to New York. It's uh, on 39th Street. And if you kind of hang out of one of the windows, you can see MetLife Building. Okay? And, and why is MetLife important? Because of the following story. An elderly gentleman, 100 years old, walks into this life insurance and says, I want life insurance. And the clerk says, we're not giving life insurance to 100 years old. And the old guy says, that's not true. My mother is, she's 120, she's insured here. So the clerk thinks better, they go to the boss, they think it's a marketing opportunity, they come back to the old man and say, you know, we'll be happy to give you life insurance, why don't you come on Tuesday, we'll have everything ready, you'll just have to sign. And the old man says, I'm sorry, I'm busy on Tuesday. I say, what do you have on Tuesday? He said, on Tuesday, it happens my grandfather is getting married. <laughs> How old is your grandfather? He said he's 150. 150 and wants to get married? He said he doesn't want to, but his parents put slots in the <laughs> Now, let me tell you, when I started, one of the studies I've been doing is centenarian studies, and when I started there, the joke was funny at my grandfather is getting married, but uh, after being in this field for a while, you needed to build the next generation which, by the way, also reflects the complexity, right? If we're going to have 150-year-old whose parents are telling him what to do, we're going to run into new trouble, right? There's uh, unintended consequences to that. So taking you like that back to uh, my life, let me make the following uh, points. Um, so, so is it possible to extend health span together with longevity? And what I'm showing you here, that those living no, uh, longer uh, are maintaining health longer, even as they grow old. So what you see in green is what happened to regular people who, and, and what we're looking at is disease-free survival. Okay, they're all, they all, the centenarians are all 100 years old, but what's their health span? And you see that the control at 60, they're trying to starting to accumulate a disease. And... When they get to 80, only maybe 10% 10, 10 of them don't have a disease. But you see that the centenarians live on average 20, 30 years longer without a disease. And even at age 100, 30% of them don't have a disease. In fact, some of them just don't wake up one morning. But this is not the interesting thing I want to tell you. The interesting thing is that they have compression of morbidity. They're sick very little time at the end of their lives, like the 30% who don't wake up in the morning. Uh, and this was the beginning of what we call the longevity dividend. We have data from the CBC, the CDC, that the last, the cost, the medical cost in the last two years of life for somebody who dies at 100 is third of those who, who dies at 70. And those guys, when they were 70, they even didn't go to the doctor because there was no need for that. Uh, so this was the economy until uh, Andrew Scott came and said, you're way off because, because those guys, it's not only that they don't have medical cost, their value is really high. They're traveling, they're spending in a, the economy. So you're, you're way off. That's where it came for $38 billion a year instead of $9 trillion. Um, so, so yeah, so that's the uh, compression of morbidity and economical benefit. And I, I'll just say that's a different lecture, but we uh, found diseases, uh, we found genetic, not only we found longevity genes, but they are already drug that developed by Merck and Ionis uh, is part of, of what they've seen. Uh, at what we've seen. And let me tell you another thing. AFAR is going to announce, I'm telling you, but they're going to announce soon, we got funding to recruit 10,000 centenarians because uh, uh, we need, the, they're just like the hallmarks of aging, there are several ways to become a centenarian, okay? So we need more centenarians to do a better discovery. And, and actually, we're, we're going to start the project this year. It's funded. 
So why do we think we can increase health span and lifespan for everyone? And by the way, now most of my talk, you heard it before. I'm trying to make it points that, that, that you, you all saw the, the hallmarks of aging. Uh, so let, let me make, we, um, we, from the industry perspective, I think two things are most important to get investors. One is there is hallmark of aging. My definition of hallmark of aging is that it goes wrong when you age, and if you treat it, you increase health span and lifespan. And the second thing, and it's important for the next, the, the right side of what you're seeing, the second thing is that you treat one hallmark, you affect the others. Okay, we, we don't have to treat all the hallmarks in order to get health span and lifespan. And this brings me to the second important thing, and I think this is the Thames study, and I think uh, Richard just made the case that when you ask people <laughs> on all level, they think the Thames study is very important, and I'll try to convince you why it is. But metformin targets all the hallmarks of aging. Okay? Now, you're telling me you're crazy. There's no way that this single drug targets all, uh, all the hallmark of aging. So let me tell you a concept that I think is very important and you'll understand the hallmarks better. Metformin, whatever it's doing, is taking an old cell, an old organ, an old body and making it younger. When it makes it younger, a lot of things are being fixed. Okay? So if you have a tunnel vision, you say, oh, Oh, that's better, so that's what metformin is doing. The other thing is better, that's what metformin is doing. But this happened in all the, uh, uh, the gero uh, pro uh, therapeutics. We started arguing, with, you know, with, when it was with sirtuins and with, with resveratrol, everybody came with, oh, that, that's doing another thing. I think it's true, but it's not indirect. And for me, a real gero therapeutic is when you come and say, I don't know, it affects all aging. I think it's probably true. And I think that's why metformin has such a strong evidence that it targets all of them. Um, so, okay, so what we want from a gerotherapeutics, okay, if we, we look at mortality or percent of people alive, uh, we want to do a placebo control study, right? And show that with gerotherapeutics, we, uh, delayed mortality, just like we do in animals. Um, it's not how long you live, because we have to do trials in several years, right? So all we can follow is mortality. So is there an example for gerotherapeutics like that? Yes. There is metformin. So there is an evidence from the UK, a really good study, but a good st it's not a clinical study. In other words, people were not assigned but scientists went to pharmaceutical and saw what happened to people who were treated on metformin or in another antidiabetic drug, sul sulfanilurea. So sulfanilurea is in blue. It's an antidiabetic drug. The control in the pharmacy are people who were treated by the same patients, had some of the same issues, by, by the same doctors, having some of the same issues but do not have diabetes. So you can see between the red and the blue that people with diabetes died twice as much. Okay, we kind of knew that. But then there are two other groups. The green one is metformin and the black one is people without diabetes but matching to the metformin group. Again, the same pharmacy age, doctors and everything. So please understand, the green line are people with diabetes, 78,000, by the way, and there are 78,000 people in black who do not have diabetes. In fact, the people who were on metformin were also more obese and were also more sick <laughs> to begin with, and yet they had 17% less mortality. So whether you compare metformin to diabetes or even to non-diabetic people, it has a marked effect on longevity, okay? This is kind of the drug we want to test. Um, so, um, so another point is that 
with this as an ammunition, we want to show that really one drug uh, can do it. And, and that will be also a template for other gerotherapeutics. And there's a line of other uh, drugs that can be repurposed even before we develop a uh, tame. Now, the cool thing is, it's not only the longevity data for decades. Metformin has been a long, long time, you know, for diabetes, formal diabetes care for 70 years. It also had huge clinical studies like preventing diabetes and preventing cardiovascular disease, like preventing deteriorating of cognitive uh, decline. And there's a 250 association studies that show around the world that people with diabetes have 30% less cancers. By the way, the effect size of metformin over several years is usually 30% for each one of those. Okay, another, another unique feature. So in fact, what I'm telling you, all the studies has been done. You might ask, you know, you've done all that. Why do you need to do it? Well, we need to do it because we need to say it's aging. Okay, so let, let me explain uh, what I mean by that. So metformin is a perfect tool for repurposing a uh, geotherapeutic. Um, so when we go to the FDA, this is the problem. In other diseases, we have a need, we have a biology, we have inventors, we have uh, biotechs, and we have drugs. The FDA doesn't recognize aging I'm not saying as a disease, as a preventable, as, as preventable condition or as disease prevention. And if disease of aging are not recognized as preventable, then A, healthcare providers don't need to pay you, <laughs> okay? If it's not something like that. And if healthcare providers don't pay you, the pharmaceuticals, and we'll need the pharmaceuticals, okay, away from the biotech, they wouldn't get into aging because they need a business plan, absolutely, okay? So we need to break this. And the importance of TAME is not about what I, sh for me, it's not, about, I know that metformin works, okay? That's not the issue for me. The issue for me is having an indication that will open, you know, pave the road for everything else. So let me explain the unique thing about this study. Ba basically, it's, People between 65 and 80 years old, 3,000 people. It's 14 centers around the United States because it's an FDA thing uh, that we need to deal with, and it's a double-blind control study. Now, what's the primary outcome? The primary outcome are time, with the F, I call them the FDA outcomes, is time to incidence of a cluster of age-related diseases. So let me explain. We're in aging. Okay, so you come with a disease. I don't know which disease you're going to go to get next. If your mother is obese and uh, if he is diabetic and you're obese, you're going to get diabetes. But I don't care because aging is going to drive your next disease. So we are agnostic. Okay, every disease that you get, you get a point. In fact, we calculate the power in a way that we don't want the FDA to stop the study if, let's say, we prevented cardiovascular disease because we're trying to do the aging part. We don't want to stop the study because now you have to offer the placebo metformin because you show that it's cardiovascular disease. So we are threading needles here, right? We're taking composite of outcomes. The composite of outcomes is not... How do you get it? It's almost not important. It's a point gathering, okay? And, and, um, and uh, we, we want to make sure that we are not uh, finishing the study before we show that there are trends, but, but, but really the, uh, the statistical point is significance for the whole cluster. Also, the NIH would pay us for doing the biomarkers, because this, this is going to be the first trial, aging trial, okay? So we want to capture the biomarkers. We want to capture the biomarkers early on, right? We don't want every drug that you're thinking of to go to phase 
uh, three trials and spend billion dollars each and fail 95 billion dollars, right, all together. So we need those biomarkers so that in phase two we can capture if really uh, we, we uh, stopped aging. And I think the biomarkers is really developing well. I think this year we'll have much more consensus, but we still need, but biomarkers is only not only chronological and biological ages, they have to change with treatment. Not all of them are going to change with treatment, okay? I, I predict that the, that the methylations are not going to be as good as, as the proteomic, for example, but we'll, we'll get there. So, um, so Andrew Scott, in his paper, did another really cool thing. He took a TAME study and he took our preliminary data and he said, let's see what's the value. Okay, now, Andrew, I'm saying the value. I'm not going to explain it. Um, but just, you know, if you want to read it, read it. You wouldn't understand it. You'll have to call Andrew like I did <laughs> to understand it. But what, what is the value of TAME? And what you see here in orange is and yellow are the effect of TAME on specific diseases. And in green, you see when you add all those diseases, because we don't care which disease we prevent, okay? We get, we get a point there. But then the blue line on top is the value added because of the other economical or value, I should say value benefit. Andrew, don't kill me here. And, the, and this is the cool thing. For TAME, we need about $10 million a year, let's say $60 million. Um, and the value, if you calculate from here, is $150 million. If we treat, looking only at the 1,500 people on metformin, okay, because the other aren't placebo. In other words, those 1,500 people on metformin are actually to have, going to have a value that's twice as large as our investment in TAME, okay? That, that's, that's how uh, uh, terrific the calculation is. So, uh, so that's the message here. So let me now show you our visit at the FDA. Ron Howard was with us, interviewed uh, the FDA, and we want to show you um, a... I, I want you to see how the FDA says, bring it on, okay? And then I'll finish. You have it, guys, right? Today, Dr. Barzilai and his colleagues will try to convince the FDA to consider their study. In advance of their critical meeting, they gather to prepare. We are here representing the field of the science of aging. And we think that this is a historical day for us because we're going to offer something that we believe is paradigm changing. I really want to frame the discussion today as what would we need to show in a clinical trial that would allow the FDA to approve a new indication for metformin for delaying multiple morbidities related to aging. Because we think metformin is the first one but there are others that could be better than metformin, and we want to make sure that that's the template. We have that hypothesis that metformin is one of those rare opportunities where it might act in a general fashion. It's an attractive hypothesis. The trial is required to see if it's true. It started with a conceptual innovation that aging can be modified. Then years of work by a growing number of scientists in labs around the world and years of convincing people of their ideas. Maybe this is what a breakthrough looks like. If the FDA accepts that aging can be treated, the scientists believe it will forever transform healthcare and medicine. I don't think that there are too many interventions in history that would rival the type of intervention that we're talking about here, influence almost everyone. As a matter of policy, the FDA does not allow cameras into official proceedings, but they did agree to an interview immediately following their meeting. We have lots of experience with claims to decrease the rate of heart attacks, to decrease the, uh, the degree of dementia, drugs that prevent strokes, uh, drugs that uh, treat your diabetes. We have lots of experience with all that. But what's being sought and being talked about is a more broad claim to prevent a lot of the consequences of aging. So the question for us is, 
How do you show that? We gauged their willingness to accept the general approach of targeting aging, something that they said right off the bat, we've never done anything like this before, and they were very receptive. Their hope is that a wide variety of age-related problems, you know, loss of muscle tone, dizziness, falling, dementia, loss of eyesight, all of those things, to do them all at once with a single treatment, that might make a convincing case that you're doing something beyond just treating the disease. That would, that would be something never done before. They didn't have any problem with the general approach. And I asked them specifically at the end, this is what I think I'm hearing. You don't have any problems with the general approach. And they basically said yes. So I don't think we could have had a better outcome. If you really are doing something to alter aging, the population of interest is everybody. It surely would be revolutionary if they can bring it off. There's no doubt about it. We always thought that the promised land is not in our reach. And I think that we are going to the promised land. The study will happen. The fact that the FDA is going to be part of it is really a major achievement and eventually will be the template and affect health span in the next decade. So you saw and heard in your own eyes and, and ears, the FDA was receptive. It was a, actually a very interesting, uh, a interesting meeting. Can I have just the light slide, which is summary? Um, and and uh, and this is just a warming act for uh, for the the next uh, uh, new news of the uh, uh, of the the new. Uh, uh, bio, uh, uh, biotech uh, Association. So the TAME study uh, provides a proof of concept that aging can be targeted and health span can be extended. Um, it inspired the FDA to make aging an indication. It provides a, a template for biotech and pharma of how to move forward with clinical studies and new biotech opportunities. Uh, the TAME uh, trial infrastructure is ready today. When I said those were a few years ago going to the promised land, we haven't entered that. I mean, COVID was in the, uh, in the middle, uh, financial things happen in the middle, but we, we are ready to move. Sorry, I didn't mean that. Uh, well, I, I did forward only, but there's, okay, but there's uh, before that. Well, uh, no, okay, N never mind, I I'm done. And, uh, and, and again, I think just to connect it to the next session, I think, um, you know, tame in parallel to your investment in the, the next few years will really assure that we have where to go, that we have partnerships with, uh, with pharmacies. And uh, I think we just have to do study like that, maybe several studies like that to move on. So thank you, and I'm, I'll be happy later to answer uh, questions. Yeah, um, Nia, would you would you be okay taking a few questions? So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know there's been a lot of lot of anticipation in uh, in the sector about the TAME trial. You mentioned obviously COVID has sort of got in the middle of all of those plans. Um, uh, it's going to take some money to do that, and I know that you've been in the process of fundraising for that. And uh, you know, the runway obviously with all these things takes time. How how's the funding going on the on the process? Um, I, I don't think I'm in liberty to say it here now. I'll tell you that we're uh, hoping for a nonprofit organization that is, let's say, in the closet now <laughs> to, to support that. And if it doesn't, we're making a plan B. Let me explain to you the issue. I think that we can get the money for TAME, but you have to understand one thing. We cannot recruit to a clinical trial a patient where we don't have money to finish the trial. So we don't need the 10 million uh, for the first year, that would be easy. We need the 60 millions 
kind of in a bank mm -hmm. or, or with a, a, a note. Uh, so the so once so if this nonprofit organization doesn't do that, we will we have a list of uh, potential people who might raise the money, and uh, will even even if we have just the beginning, we'll start the organization. We'll be ready for patient one once the last check is in. Yeah, and uh, I guess the, the, the growth in the sector is probably going to help because the appetite's going up in terms of different funding communities as well as obviously I, I know. I, I, I'm very, uh, look, I'm very optimistic, but I'm an optimist and I've been optimistic. You, you know, this is the most frustrating period of my life, right? Because it was so obvious. It was such a strong, a, a strong case. The preliminary data were incredible. The biology was incredible. And I thought the NIH would fund it. And the NIH review was reviewed by people who are cardiovascular or cancer, and they said, what? Aging can be targeted and one drug can do it? I mean, you're dreaming, right? If they read the, the grant, actually, they would see the compelling evidence. But it's kind of interesting, and, and I think it just shows when it happened, everybody will say, how are we so stupid, you know? What, what did we know now that we didn't know before? And it's terribly frustrating for me because of all the circumstances of, you know, we had a billionaire that was going to do that, and then he's not longer, well, he's still a billionaire, but not. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and this is a frustration, but nevertheless, it's clearly, I mean, you heard, you heard about this trial today so many times, it's out there. <laughs> People are taking it for me, right? So it's out there, it, it'll happen. So interesting that you showed the hallmarks of aging and how you feel that metformin obviously is gonna be supporting all of those. Uh, could you maybe just expand on that a little bit in terms of how you see that works at a uh, metabolic level? Um, at the endpoint level, well, well, so it targets uh, all the hallmarks of aging. So it's increased health span and lifespan. If you're asking about the specific mechanism, um, so metformin is getting into the cell with a, with a special transporter, a metformin transporter, and binds to complex one in the mitochondria. And then there are two pathways. One is very metabolic, and it ends up on things like mTOR, autophagy, things like that. And one has to do with the fact that now the mitochondria it's a little cyanide in a sense, right? The mitochondria is not effective. There is less oxidative, uh, uh, oxidative stress. Um, there is effect on inflammation. And the complexity is that you can have metformin acting on some of those pathways, even without mitochondria. There is rho zero cells without mitochondria. It still does something, you know? You can do it in animals that don't have AMP kinase, which is thought to be the nutrient the first nutrient regulator of this pathway. You have activity without that. You have activity that's epigenetics and uh, you have effects on microbiome that are associated with metformin. So to tell you that, when, when, uh, uh, the point is that if any one of you are being approached by a company that says, we'll develop an inhibitor to, um, to complex one of the mitochondria, I, I would say, I don't know if that's the most important thing, okay? Uh, because there are so many other things that metformin is doing. Sorry uh, that I bored you, but at least I had a chance to be professorial like Jim Kirkland. So. <laughs> well, and, you know, I remember when we spoke before, we did, did a conference about a year or so ago, and the conversation came up about dosage of metformin. And I guess um, a lot of people are kind of off prescription and they, they're taking metformin. And I remember you surprised me a lot by saying, well, we don't really know what the doses should be. So is that, are you getting any closer on that? Yeah, the, so how did we make a decision? Some people, and we were a bunch of geroscientists, right? We're geroscientists, there's no company behind us. So some says, you should give less metformin. I mean, they're elderly, okay, well, give them less metformin. Some says, are you kidding? You wanna do aging? Give them double the dose of metformin. But we have all those studies that included also elderly people, and they on average use 1,500 milligrams a day, okay? It's a good dose, it's not the maximal dose. It's just below the maximal dose for diabetes effect, okay? But it's the dose where we had the preliminary data, and we just played it safe and decided on this dose. So two things I don't know. 
is this going to be the final dose once we experiment it? Are doctors going to give more metformin or less metformin and say, you know, it's better? Um, the second that is very important, you notice the study is 65 to 80 years old. And it's because we, at that age, there, there's lots of outcomes. We need all those outcomes, right? Alzheimer comes a little later. We need all those outcomes. At the end of ten, I wouldn't be able to tell you when to take metformin. I mean, if you ask me, most of the studies have started metformin at 50, after the age of 50. So I think 50 would be actually the right age for sure. Mm. Uh, but this study would show what happened to 65 and older, chronologically. Uh, question from the audience, James. Yeah, I'm just building to an end. So you're, you and you know, Steve and Steve and Mark and the, and the whole like group that approached the FDA about TAME, you're pretty unique in this field, right? Not a lot of folks have gotten to interact with the FDA and gotten direct feedback. And you know, that term, aging, longevity, it's really what unites this whole group of us here today. But I've been reflecting and thinking on this quite a bit recently, and I wonder how much our excitement about the basic biology of aging has also been a landmine or, or a trap in a way of the way that we talk about this field. And so, you know, as we watched the National Geographic presentation, I'm curious, do you think that we would have better success if we stopped referring to aging or longevity in any sense, except when we're talking internally, and just talk to things in terms of multimorbidity risk reduction, and only ever use those terms? So, very, very important point. I think it's an extremely important point. Um, is aging a disease, right? Is aging a disease? And we, we have argument in, in the field. Actually, there's going to be a, a tweet by both David Sinclair and me at the same time. We, are, we were in a meeting yesterday when a, a David Sinclair says aging is a disease. And my point is aging is the mothers of diseases, okay? Clearly. And aging starts early, okay? A aging shouldn't happen the way it is. But the elderly don't want to be called sick. Okay, especially after COVID, where they are isolated, taken to islands, loneliness, right? They don't want to be called sick. American Federation of Aging Research doesn't want to call aging sick. Um, the ARP, the Retirement Federation, don't want to. We need coalition. Okay, it'll be terrible if we come to help those people and they're against us because we call them sick. So yesterday, so David says, you know what? They called obesity. And people were upset why obesity is a disease, and now people are accepting it. And I made the point that in my, I'm, I'm actually seeing patients from time to time, in my clinic, the electronic medical records are now open to the people, to the patients, and we're not allowed to put obesity in our note. We can put BMI, but not obesity. And then we're going to bill for somebody who's obese and the insurance company says, you didn't say obese. So we have a lot of issue, but I think it shows you if we call aging a disease, you know, eventually the elderly will say, I don't want to, I don't want you to write it like that. So the four o'clock, I think now the four o'clock tweet is let's call aging something else. Okay. Oh, oh, we ask people to recommend. Maybe we just have to change the language so we don't annoy the people we need this coalition. Thank you. That was a great. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that. I mean, obviously, TAME is very important to all of us in the industry. And uh, good luck with the funding. Thanks. Great. Thank you.